Hello, welcome to BBC World News. I'm Martine Dennis. And I'm Sally Bundock. The headlines. Venezuela mourns. Hugo Chavez, the controversial and charismatic president of Venezuela, dies at the age of 58. Vice President Nicolas Maduro heads a provisional government until elections next month. He announced Hugo Chavez's death and called for Venezuelans to show love, peace and discipline. Recibimos la información más dura y trágica. We've received the hardest and most tragic news that we could deliver to our people. At 4.25 p.m. this afternoon, today, the 5th of March, President Hugo Chavez died. China and America agree new sanctions on North Korea. Pyongyang retaliates by threatening to tear up the truce which ended the Korean War. In business, we'll look at how Hugo Chavez transformed his nation's economy and in particular, the oil industry. Also coming in World Business Report, the U.S. shares closed at an all-time high last night. We'll find out why the market is doing so well when the economy is so sluggish. But first this morning, Venezuela has entered seven days of mourning for President Chavez, who died at the age of 58. Now, he'd been in office for 14 years and is believed to have had cancer in his pelvic area, but his exact illness was never really disclosed. Most recently, he'd been suffering from a severe respiratory infection. Now, Venezuela has declared this period of mourning, and Mr. Chavez's body will lie in state for three days until his funeral and memorial service on Friday. Our correspondent in the Venezuelan capital, Caracas, Irena Caselli, has this report. The death of President Chavez came as tragic news. If not for everyone, then for very many people in Caracas who gathered outside the hospital where he died. Hugo Chavez had been a leader like no other. He was fiery, vocal, he liked to dance and sing. A military commander who once led a coup, he had been governing Venezuela since 1999. He was first diagnosed with cancer in 2011, but he said he'd managed to overcome it. He ran his campaign for the presidential election in October, saying he had been cured. And he won. But the cancer came back, and he left for Cuba for more treatment. And then came the bad news. A las 4.25 de la tarde, de hoy 5 de marzo, ha fallecido el comandante presidente at 4.25 today, on the 5th March, Hugo Chavez has died. Chavez supporters have gathered here tonight in downtown Caracas, next to the statue of Simón Bolívar, to mourn their president. Some have tears in their eyes, others have been telling me that they feel like they've lost a father. The Venezuelan government has announced seven days of official mourning. The funeral will be held on Friday, and then come new elections. Chavez appointed Vice President Nicolás Maduro as his preferred successor, and he will most likely be the new president of Venezuela. The question, however, remains if he will be able to lead the country through the loss of its iconic leader. Irene Caselli, BBC News, Caracas. Well, I caught up with Irena a little while ago, and she gave me the very latest about the reaction on the streets of Caracas. Well, there are still supporters of Mr. Chavez gathered uh, where, um, where you could see in the package just now in Plaza Bolivar by the Bolivar statue, but also around the hospital where the president died. In other parts of the city, actually, um, it looks uh, like nobody's around. It's very deserted. Soon after the announcement, people were around for a little, little bit and then everybody went home. Um, and it's, it's quite empty in the rest of the city. I mean, we, we know that he's a hugely f popular figure in Venezuela and beyond indeed, but he was also a very polarizing figure, wasn't he? Because the camp who are against Chavez and his severe program of nationalization are also extremely uh, disaffected, aren't they, with the measures that he put in place? 
Yes, I mean, the opposition has been calling Mr. Chavez an authoritarian leader. Um, they won't be uh, unhappy that he's gone, except that they will now have to go against uh, the new leader of the party, uh, Nicolas Maduro, who will most likely be running in the upcoming elections. So Nicolas Maduro takes over as the interim head of state. Uh, elections will be held within 30 days. Yes, elections will probably be called uh, after the seven days of mourning. So we can expect to have them by uh, mid-April. And the most likely candidate for the opposition will probably be Enrique Capriles, who ran, uh, who ran against Mr. Chavez in October, uh, and he came second. He lost to Mr. Chavez by 11 points. So I suppose the question is then, will that landslide of support that uh, got uh, President Chavez into office on several occasions uh, with a landslide uh, victory. Will that support move over and adopt uh, Nicolas Maduro, presumably, who will be his successor as head of the party? Some analysts have been talking about uh, the emotional factor. Right now, a lot of Venezuelans feel like they uh, had a very huge loss, the loss of a father. And according to many analysts, that emotional factor will help uh, place the votes that once went to uh, Chavez um, to Maduro. So it's very likely that Mr. Maduro will remain very popular and will probably uh, win an election against Mr. Capriles. Well, reaction to the death of Hugo Chavez has been coming in from across the world. Our correspondent, James Kelly, has the latest. <laughs> Tears on the streets of Caracas. It's clear the grief is shared by many. The Venezuelan president was revered by his supporters. This man says of Hugo Chavez, we love him. May you rest and may you see glory. Tributes from across Latin America were swift in coming. Por su patria, por la patria grande, como Simón Bolívar. He fought for his country, for the great nation like Simón Bolívar, a friend who gave his entire life for the liberation of the Venezuelan people, the people of Latin America. Latinoamericano. I'd like to express our profound condolences and tell the Venezuelan people that after a hard and difficult fight for his life, President Chavez is finally resting in peace. Today, as always, we must recognize that he was a great leader, an irreparable loss, and above all, a friend of Brazil, a friend of the Brazilian people. Queremos expresar nuestra nuestro profundo expresar nuestro pesar y nuestro profundo dolor. We'd like to express our profound grief and pain for our kindred people in Venezuela. We'd like to say to the family of Hugo Chavez that we want to give them a strong hug. The impact of Hugo Chavez's death is hitting particularly hard in Cuba, Venezuela's closest ally. An official statement said President Chavez had stood by Fidel Castro like a true son. The Argentine president, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, said she'd cancelled all her appointments after hearing the news of the death of her friend and ally. She's declared three days of national mourning in Argentina. A contrasting perspective came from Washington. Hugo Chavez crusaded against U.S. influence. In a statement, President Obama was already looking to the future. He said, as Venezuela begins a new chapter in its history, the United States remains committed to policies that promote democratic principles, the rule of law, and respect for human rights. The British Foreign Secretary, William Hague, has also issued a statement saying, as president of Venezuela for 14 years, he has left a lasting impression on the country and more widely. I would like to offer my condolences to his family and to the Venezuelan people at this time. What the future holds for Venezuela remains unclear. For now, its people are coming to terms with the passing of a hugely influential politician whose death will have reverberations well beyond their country's borders. James Kelly, BBC News. So Hugo Chavez was 58 years old. He'd been suffering from cancer for the last couple of years. Here's our diplomatic correspondent, James Robbins now, who looks back at his life. Hugo Chavez saw himself as a revolutionary leader. He was a hero to many of Venezuela's poorest people 
but a villain to opposition parties. They hated the friends he kept and the abuses of power they accused him of. This is how Hugo Chavez originally burst onto the world stage. In 1992, as an army colonel, he led a military coup, trying and failing to grab power after decades of more or less corrupt rule in Venezuela. Hugo Chavez was released after two years in jail, and the young army officer built his popularity by denouncing the rottenness he wanted to replace. With these corrupt people, you have to take everything they've stolen away from them and put them in prison, not under house arrest. Put them in a cell and turn them into a public disgrace. That's necessary for Venezuela's moral recovery. And the soldier transformed himself into radical politician. Finally elected president in 1998, Hugo Chavez transformed Venezuela's politics and presidential dress. Supporters were ecstatic as key industries were steadily nationalized, including oil, source of the country's wealth. President Chavez used the money largely to fund massive health and welfare programs. But many oil workers were dismayed, their bosses sacked, production steadily falling. In 2002, the whole country was embroiled in a general strike, and Chavez was briefly pushed from office. But just two days later, after his supporters, mainly the poor, took to the streets, President Chavez was back in the palace. The president's very deliberate radicalism and his choice of friends made him enemies at home and around the world. His reliance on Cuba's Fidel Castro appalled those on the right. Alliance with Iran's President Ahmadinejad inflamed Washington. Using the UN stage to insult President George W. Bush divided the world. Yesterday, the devil came here. Right here. Right here. And it smells of sulfur still today. And in Venezuela itself, Hugo Chavez's unique style divided the country. As part of his regular TV show, Allo Presidente, he paraded his socialism, something he stressed talking to the BBC in 2010. Is it possible to have genuine democracy and genuine respect for the rule of law within your socialism? The only way to save the world is through socialism, but a socialism that exists within a democracy. There's no dictatorship here. I was elected three times, and when the rich threw me out in a coup, the people brought me back to power. But Hugo Chavez also presided over Venezuela's slide into recession, despite the country's great oil wealth and despite soaring growth in the rest of South America. Paying huge subsidies to provide imported food at low prices for the poor couldn't be sustained, and uncontrolled violent crime marked another failure. Support for opposition parties had grown before Hugo Chavez fell ill. Flown to Cuba for cancer surgery, he was visited by his political hero, Fidel Castro. Despite his illness, the president was re-elected to a six-year term in October 2012, but he was unable to attend his own inauguration in January. In spite of opposition protests, Venezuela's Supreme Court approved an indefinite delay. So how will Hugo Chavez be remembered? As a true friend of the poor or a radical turned autocrat? His rule in Venezuela polarized the nation, between those who condemned Hugo Chavez as a wrecker and those who hailed him as a rescuer. Well, Sally's going to take a look at the Venezuelan economy and what the Bolivarian revolution actually did for that. And, and that's uh, a debate. many people obviously divided, aren't they, as to the success of it? Very divided, but those that I speak to outside who have been involved in Venezuela from a, a business perspective or even a markets or oil markets perspective uh, say that the legacy he has left behind is, is quite an economic muddle. I mean, during that 14 years that he was in office, he certainly transformed the Venezuela into a socialist state. He was, of course, very fortunate to be in power during a surge in oil prices. When he came to office, the price of a Venezuelan barrel of oil would be on the market for around $9. During his reign, it climbed up to sort of $128 or more dollars a barrel. It paid for a nationalization drive that saw the state take control of almost every industry, including the nation's oil fields. But his economic transformation also had consequences such as sparking shortages of basic goods 
basic food items, inflation jumping to 30%. We'll discuss in more detail in World Business Report. Also, take a look at this man behind me. <laughs> He's one of the many traders on Wall Street. The Dow Jones Industrial Average closed at an all-time high on Tuesday. Uh, the champagne goes, is flowing on the trading floors around the world. It surpassed the previous record set in October 2007 before the financial crisis struck. Now, the strength of the stock market is surprising to many Americans. Normal households who've been suffering from persistent unemployment of 7.9% and sluggish growth. So really what's happening as far as the financial markets are concerned, we will be discussing that too in World Business Report. But there you have it, the close on the Dow, up almost a percent. The S&P 500, that's the broader market in the States, the 500 biggest companies listed in America. Their markets went up by a percent. And in, the, in, uh, in Tokyo, we've just closed the Nikkei up two, over 2%, two and Hong Kong is still trading at the moment up a uh, percent. Now, many are arguing, why is this going on? Well, a lot are looking at the central banks around the world and government around the world and all the action they're taking to try and stimulate their economies and the yen of course is proving to be fairly weak as well which helps uh, the exporters in Japan so we'll unpack all of that there's other business stories to mention too I won't talk about it all now I will see you soon promises promises pretty packed program <laughs> Sal thank you very much see you, see you in a little while lots more to come here at BBC World News apart from Sally and World Business Report Ronaldo's return why a blast from the past meant a bad night for Manchester United in the Champions League. Now, the internet has been abuzz with the reaction to the death of President Chavez. Let's get to uh, some of them now. And uh, the president of Haiti, Michel J. Martelly, has uh, entered the Twitter sphere, saying, um, extending his condolences on behalf of the people of Haiti. One of Chavez's daughters, Maria Gabriela, tweeted as well. She said, she's lost for words. She said, farewell, my daddy. George Galloway, the left-wing British uh, MP, Member of Parliament, who was a, a close friend of Chavez, he tweeted, farewell, Comandante, and he described him as a modern-day Spartacus. Well, not just world leaders, and politicians who've been making their feelings clear. Also, Dominic James Brown, he tweeted saying, Chavez did things he didn't agree with but gave millions of people hope. Millions of people who had nothing. So some of your thoughts on the BBC. You're with BBC World News. I'm Martine Dennis. These are the top stories. There's only one real top story this morning, and that is uh, seven days of mourning entered by Venezuela now to mark the death of President Hugo Chavez, who died at the age of 58. The authorities there say fresh elections will be called within 30 days. Vice President Nicolas Maduro provisionally head a government until then. But another of today's main stories is North Korea, because it's threatening to abandon its 60-year-old ceasefire agreement with South Korea, and is proclaiming its readiness to launch strikes. Now, this move comes uh, after the U.S. tabled a U.N. Security Council resolution which proposes exceptional sanctions that would target some of North Korea's diplomatic community. These are sanctions which have significantly been agreed with China. It's being reported that the Security Council will vote on this resolution on Thursday. Well, our correspondent in the South Korean capital, Seoul, is Lucy Williamson, and she says it's unusual to see the United States and China seeing eye to eye on the Security Council. I think there's lots of moving parts in this story at the moment. The fact that they are moving quickly, apparently, towards some kind of agreement on what sanctions to put on North Korea. The fact that you have US and South Korean military exercises going on here at the moment. The fact that South Korea has a new president. And now the fact that North Korea has thrown into this mix this latest threat. There seems to be an awful lot of tension and, as I say, lots of moving parts at the moment. Now, not that long ago, there was a great deal of optimism, I recall. Uh, a new leader in North Korea in Pyongyang could herald uh, a new era of cooperation. That doesn't seem to be the case. 
No, it doesn't, does it? Um, certainly on the surface, he seemed to do things quite differently to his father. Um, we saw him watching a show with uh, Disney cartoon characters involved in it. We, so we saw him showing off his new wife with her fashionable clothes and, and fairly short skirts. Uh, we saw him being very warm and, and very tactile with the soldiers that he, he went to greet. He seemed to have a very different personal style, but when it comes to the politics, it seems he's as hardline as his father and as hardline as his grandfather. Let's have a look at some other news now. And uh, police in the Egyptian city of Port Said have used tear gas to try to disperse crowds of protesters during violent clashes in the city. Officials say more than 400 people have been wounded. Protests have been taking place there since January, when 21 local football fans were sentenced to death over football riots, which left 74 people dead in February 2012. Election officials in Nairobi have again appealed for patience as Kenyans wait for news of more results from Monday's presidential election. Their publication has been delayed by hitches with the electronic voting system, but officials are saying updated figures will be published shortly. Results so far give a significant lead to the Deputy Prime Minister, Uhuru Kenyatta. Now, a report is due this week on the hot air balloon crash that killed 19 tourists in the Egyptian city of Luxor last month. Now, the tragedy has been the latest blow for tourism in what was until very recently a popular holiday destination, particularly for people from the UK. Aline McBall reports. The amazing Temple of Karnak. Parts of the complex are over 3,000 years old. Pharaoh after Pharaoh added chapels and obelisks and great halls to the site. But these days, so few are coming to appreciate it. Well, a few years ago, several thousand tourists a day were coming to Karnak Temple. Now, in over an hour of us being here, we've seen little more than a handful. The revolution and the images of violence from Egypt led to this dramatic downturn in tourism. Shirley and John Pickup from Northern England have been coming here for 20 years. Since the revolution, we've been here practically on our own. We've been sat down here on our own. Um, and when you're back home and you tell friends and family that you're heading out to Egypt again, what's their reaction? Their reaction is, are you safe going out there? And our reaction is, yes, we feel very safe going out there. There's no reason why none of you should go to Egypt. Oh. This week, some of Luxor's traders blocked the road to the Valley of the Kings, demanding their rents come down. Because of the low number of visitors, they say they're not making money. People in this city never thought they'd see a day they couldn't rely on tourism. The hardships even affecting the horses that pull the sightseeing carriages. Kim Taylor from the UK runs a charity to care for the animals. Many are being brought in malnourished. People have just got no work. And so if you've got a family and you've got a horse or a donkey, then you've got to feed your family first, um, forgetting that the animal is probably the one that's bringing in the money. <laughs> but yeah, people have got to feed their families, so the horses are definitely suffering. But everyone's suffering. Ahmed, who takes boat trips along the Nile, told us he can wait all day for a single customer that never comes. He feels the world's got it wrong about Egypt, but he also knows every time there are more reports of violence here, money for him will be even harder to come by. Aleem McBool, BBC News in Luxor. Now, last night, Tuesday, was a bad night for Manchester United. They were knocked out of the Champions League by Real Madrid. Real's tie with United was level at 1-1 on aggregate, heading into the second leg, and United took the lead just after the half-time interval when Sergio Ramos directed the ball into his own net. Well, the match turned around when Nani was sent off for a high challenge, which clearly angered the United manager, Sir Alex Ferguson. And 10 minutes later, Luka Modric levelled the game up with a cracking shot that deflected in off the post. Then Cristiano Ronaldo, on his old turf at Old Trafford, confirmed a 2-1 win on the night and a 3-2 aggregate score. I don't think the manager has... Uh is in any fit state to talk to to the referee about the decision. Um, I think it speaks volumes that, that I'm sat here 
speaking to you at this moment in time and not the manager of this fantastic football club. I think we all saw and we all witnessed a decision which seemed very harsh, possibly incredible at that moment in the game. I try to be honest and be honest is, uh, is to say that in my opinion the best team lost. But That's football. And in Germany, Borussia Dortmund eased through to the last eight after a 3 0 second leg win against Ukrainian Shakhtar Donetsk. Felipe Santana scoring the first just after the half hour mark. Six minutes later, the lead was doubled when Mario Gotze tucked the ball home. Jakub Blaszczykowski made it three after a goalkeeping error, meaning a 5 2 aggregate win for the German champions. So that's a look at a little bit of sports news. So uh, a reminder then of the main news this morning. The charismatic but controversial president of Venezuela, Hugo Chavez, has died from the cancer he's been battling for many months. He was 58 and had been in power for 14 years and had undergone several operations in Cuba but hadn't been seen in public for several months. His body will be taken to the military academy until Friday when there's a funeral. Hello, there'll be more warm spring sunshine and offer across large parts of northern Europe during Wednesday, but further south it's a very different scene. Areas of low pressure bringing some further ugly weather, particularly across the south of France and northern Italy. Very strong winds here, heavy snowfall over the Alps, a wet day for Corsica and Sardinia. That rain gradually spiralling towards the Balkans. More showery rain to come too across large parts of Spain and Portugal. It's a cloudy day in the UK, but plenty of sunshine again for Germany and Poland, Denmark and southern Sweden with temperatures above average. A sunny day for much of Turkey, although it's a bit cooler across the southeast of Europe. Temperatures again reaching double figures in Berlin. A cloudy day perhaps in Brussels, but here still up to 14. Wet weather in Milan. The downpours will...